Howdy, folks. Thanks a lot, Jim. That was awesome. Um, yeah, you said very nice things about me. Uh, I, I, I'll try to uh, make sure some of them come true. <laughs> hey, folks, thanks for tuning in. As I understand, a lot of you guys are, are new to, um, to the Angus Australia. And um, all I got to say is congratulations on joining one of the most progressive breeds in the world. Let's move forward and talk about some cool stuff that we've done over here in Esperance. Um, I've given a lot of talks over the year on building a better cow. So I'm gonna to talk to you about a, a producer demonstration site that we ran through a producer group down in our A sheet through Meat and Livestock Australia. Producer demonstration sites are freaking amazing. If you are part of a producer group and you've got something that you're doing that you wanna share with others around Australia, chasing up Meat and Livestock Australia and getting into their PDS program, they have calls for submissions, uh, I think every year, every two years, get into it. It is awesome. And it really has um, been fantastic for our group down here. So for this PDS, we had a few people that tipped in. So there's a sheep, meat and livestock, Australia, Vetakino helped us out with product, ABS helped us out with some semen and Richard White as well. The goal of this project is pretty simple. We essentially hijacked half the heifers on a number of properties and then tracked them all the way through. So conception rate, um, calving, dystocia, um, heifer loss, calf loss, um, uh, weaning weights and rebreeding rates, and then crunch some numbers about two and a half thousand heifers enrolled on 15 different sites pretty cool and the goal was to encourage uh, the uptake of fixed time ai and commercial heifer mating programs and so we needed to estimate the cost or try to estimate the cost of integrating fixed time ai versus natural mating and then capture those differences and work out a return on investment of integrating fixed time ai you know that we could or cost that we could then go back and say was that worthwhile of the genetic progress Thank you, Vetikino, for your help. They make key mates. That's what I mostly use myself. And thank you, ABS, for providing these sires and Richard White for Airedale General. Um, part of it was just comparing the EBVs of some of the AI sires versus some natural mated sires from some of the groups. We pulled those together and we graphed it. As you can see here, as you would expect, when you purchase an AI sire, you've got a higher accuracy generally. The sire's been used more. So if you look on breed plan um, or the trans TAS, you'll find the accuracy beneath all those indexes and it tells you how likely that is to be accurate. So it's, it's an estimate initially based on the mid-parent value and then genomics improves it further. And then having progeny and having their genomics and, and, um, and then increase, increases the accuracy over time. But you'll also notice that these sires that we chose are, are pretty awesome in most respects, especially we were focusing on calving ease. As you can see that calving ease direct, indirect, um, short GL and um, lower birth weight. Then in growth, we were also chasing more growth, 200, 400, 600 day weight than, than the average of what people had chosen. And they're good bulls that they'd chosen to put over their heifers, they're appropriate bulls. But the sires that we use from AI are often exceptional comparatively. And then, and then I, I often try to keep an eye on mature cow weight. So we try to keep that mature cow weight a bit moderate. And that's another talk we can talk about another day. Um, just running through bull mating costs. We, we don't have much time here, so I'm gonna zip through this slide really quickly. But looking at um, Beef Central's 2017 average for um, sale bulls in 2017 was 7,600. 7, Recently, it's been over 14 grand for the average Angus bull. So welcome to the party, Angus breeders. Um, the, uh, if you look at um, the cost of a bull, you got his purchase price minus his cull price, divided by his running cost, divided by the number of cows that he covers. So if we said at 3%, anyway, it works out to the bull's cost of $100 uh, per calf produced. Um, part of the study, we the PDS, we compared the, the mating weights of the animals. And as we expected, if they were light, we had a poor conception rate. Interestingly, if they're quite heavy, we had a lower than expected conception rate. I think that's because the really heavy girls um, were often obese and it interfered with some of the um, some of the uh, pharmacologicals that we used to, the pharmaceuticals that we used to run the fixed MAI program. But yeah, as you can see, once we got up to about 300 kilos, they were statistically the same, but obviously you want to get them to a certain weight. We only had 50% and those that were between 252, 75 kilos. Here's a comparison of the preg rates. Here's the collected data. And if you look down there on the average, the average site had a 3.1% improvement in conception rate in those that were AI'd and backed up for six weeks versus those that ran with the bull for seven weeks. And so what we did is we AI'd half of them on the mating start date, the other half went to the bull. 10 days later, we boxed them and they stayed together for the rest of the study. And so we were able to improve the conception rate by 3.1 on the average farm or a, around 1% in the total data set combined. Um, so we take that and retrospectively look at the cost of mating and then we look at the actual cost of every bull that was AI. So if you look down here on the, on the syndicate mated A group, these guys had about 400 heifers. It would require 12 bulls to do the job. We've got our maths we had before. This was their conception rate. We could then take that back to a, uh, a value per calf produced. Up top, because we integrated AI, we were able to reduce their bull fraction from a 3% bull coverage to 2%, um, so one to 50. And then we have got our actual fixed time AI integration cost. So for that particular producer, it cost them $53.40 for semen, drugs, me to stand behind them and travel to get to them. 
And then the cost difference there, which was $18 per calf in the hole for using AI versus bulls. And that varied from producer to producer. The second producer, like number B there, because he only needed one bull, regardless of whether or not he AI'd, he got a $60 difference. And small producers like that, typically with heifers, I advocate that they just do one round of AI and that's it. So let's play some ball here. So here we are, the average, the average, um, the average cost of integrating fixed time AI versus running bulls was $23 extra to, per calf. So we're $23 behind the eight ball. Uh, but don't forget, you guys work for a living. You can't just underestimate what your time's worth. So we asked the producers, how long did it take you to synchronize and run them through and stand around while AI item? And we worked out as about 140 uh, man hours, including mustering per 100 cows enrolled in fixed time AI. So we said, what's your time worth? I said 30 bucks an hour, it's pretty cheap. Regardless, that came out to $14.50 per pregnancy. So that means we're behind by $37, pretty simple. Then we did our preg testing. Again, we got our, you've seen this slide before, we'll, we'll run up the, the combined average of 0.8%. So we'll always err on the side of caution on our statistical analysis. And so if you look there, the total data set were down 0.8%. So we said to the producers, well, what's that worth to you? Now, we'll, later on, I'll talk about how I, I don't want to get all my heifers pregnant. And so I tend to, with my local producers, try to emphasize that a heifer that gets pregnant is important, but we don't want them all to get pregnant. If you hang too much value on that animal getting pregnant, you're going to spend way too long and way too much time and energy trying to get her pregnant. Let the AI program or the bull mating program or both do the job of choosing your replacement females. So there's not a big cost in an empty heifer. She can be diagnosed early. She can be sold into a different value chain. So we said hundred dollars. So anyway, that's, that's 80 cents. Hey, we're on the board. We got a dollar. We got a long way to far away back at $36. We measured dystocia between the different properties. Um, we had some properties that got absolutely handed to them with calving trouble. Um, and we had some that hardly had any trouble at all. But when we averaged the total statistics, um, we, we halved the, um, the level of dystocia um, in, in, on the average farm. And overall, we, re we reduced the dystocia by 1.6% or a 21% reduction in total dystocia. And between the girls that were AI'd and backed up, so they still had natural mating versus those that just went to the bull. Pretty cool, eh? That's rad. <clears throat> so he said to the producer, hey, um, you know, what's that worth to you? And I said, well, you know, we've got to get a vet out. It's going to cost a bit. Or we've got to muster, muster the animal. <clears throat> pay our employees to manage that calving issue. So it was $3 distributed over the population with an incidence of 1.6%. <clears throat> so now we got $4, which is 37 bucks. Right up, calf mortality. Well, we were able to reduce calf mortality on the average farm by 60%. And in the combined data set, we have the amount of calves that died. So more calves died in the ones that were strictly naturally mated versus those that were AI'd and then, and then um, backed up with bulls. So 2.7% reduction. So again, we say radio, 2.7, what's that worth to you? And we decided an, a calf that died at birth was, was $500 difference. This is Pimp, he's my own son, or my own bull, I should say, 17 days early, short GL, unbelievably low birth weight, went in Angus our benchmarking uh, a couple of years ago. What a cracking bull, that's a, a Naranda Pimp. Um, so now we're $18 versus 37 bucks. Radio, what about heifer mortality? Well, we didn't get much heifer mortality, um, but in the naturally mates, we had 2.6% of the heifers on average per farm um, uh, die during, uh, during calving. In the total data set, it was 1.3%. So that's a 94% reduction in dystocia on the average farm or a 73.7% reduction on, in the entire data set. So pretty significant when you look at the percentage, when it's significant, you go, wow. But again, it's pretty low numbers. But again, 0.95%. So we said to, to our producers, what is the heifer that dies at calving worth to you? And, and at that time, when calf, heifers preg testing calf worth about 16, 1700 bucks, plus you got to hang on to her until she calves, we said that's probably worth a couple grand. In today's market, that's more like three, three and a half. So we said two grand, 0.95%. That's a $19 cost distributed over the population. Well, lo and behold, hell, we broke even. Well, there you go. And we haven't even factored in genetic improvement. But wait, there's more. Stay tuned. Now, this is the cool part. Right, so we map the distribution of when the calves hits. If you look at that blue group blue graph, the, the peak of that is the negative eight is the, um, is the average calving date for the girls that were in the AI program that, so that, that, that uh, conceived to AI. So see that bell curve distribution? And you can see the expected calving date there according to Dr. Google of 283 days. And then there's the bull mates, which are the orange. As you can imagine, they, you know, 5% came on per day for 21 days. And 3% uh, fell pregnant on average per, per day for 21 days. So you get that, what you get is kind of a plateau with a slope on either side. And so that's what you see, like a, a flattened bell curve. And then the cows, and then the next 21 days, you'd expect to get 24%, so 1% per day in natural mating. But in the AI group, we've got this big spike of, you know, about 50, 60% of the, uh, the calves. And then day 21, 
down there, you see another little bell curve and then another one out at A42. That is super cool, isn't it? Right. So if we crunch those numbers, the, um, the average calf born from the AI group and backed up calved on day 2.65 of the calving season. So on average, the, anim, the average calf born out of the fixed time AI integrated group calved before day three of the calving season. And in the syndicate mated group, it was day, day 11. Pretty cool. Well, why is that? Well, part of it's that GL gestation length. We were choosing bulls with exceptional, exceptionally short gestation length. And if you look at the Angus breed plan, we brought the Angus breed back by 4.4 days over the last 20 some years. It's pretty amazing. We also um, selected for growth, right? So let's look at some cool stuff here. Weaning weights. Well, these calves were born early on average eight days, like we just showed you. Um, uh, but we also used sires that had higher 200 day weights. So when we look at the sires, bang, in every group where we were able to weigh calves, the calves were significantly heavier in the, in the, um, in the groups that were enrolled in the fixed time AI program to the tune of 15 kilos. That's cool. Why is it cool? Well, because 15 kilos back then equaled $4 per kilo equals $60. Nowadays, it equals a little bit more, doesn't it? So we're probably talking more like 60 bucks. Regardless, back then, bang, 97 to 37 bucks. We're in the money, we're in front, but there's more, but there's more. So this is pretty rad too. Look at this, it's called a survival curve. So uh, the girls started calving in the, in the um, AI group 22 days before the calving date. And by the, by the calving due date, 204, you know, 283 days, Dr. Google, 63.8% of the heifers had already calved within the groups that were... Uh, that were enrolled in the fixed time AI program versus only 21.6% of the girls in the, uh, in, the, in the naturally mated group. Why is that important? Well, if an animal calves early, especially as a heifer, she's more likely to be cycling when the bull goes back in, which means she's more likely to get back in calf. And that's what we saw in the data. If you look at this rebreeding success, which is freaking cool. We, um, we were able to, on the average farm, increase the conception rate in the first calvers, which typically struggle. And most people that mate their heifers the same time as their cows, which is a no-no, coming to my other talks, Mate your heifers early, made them short. But anyway, if you're mating them the same time as your cows, you'll always have a, a bit of a slump in your first calvers after they have that first calf. Um, we were able to get not, uh, a conception rate of 90.4% in, um, in the fixed time AI integrated group, that's the AI plus backups, versus a conception rate of 85.8% in, uh, in the natural mate. So an improvement of 4.5% on the average farm, or in the combined data set, an improvement of 2.7%, reducing the number of empties by 21.4%. That's cool, ain't it? It is cool. I love it. I love this stuff. Cool, cool, cool. So we said to the producers, what's that work? Now, my clients, I really educate them. The key is to get a girl to calve early as a three-year-old, having already weaned a healthy calf as a two-year-old, right? So my guys really see the value and or the expense in losing an animal after it has its first calf. I mean, that's a real bummer. She's raised a heifer that's raised you a calf and then doesn't get back in calf. And now she's left the party with she's just starting to get a she's just starting to get her dentition happening. She's got her whole life in front of her. Now she's empty and she's gonna end up in a Mrs. Max. That is a tragedy. So we said a thousand bucks. Arguably that's more in these today's days. So that's a 2.7% difference, that's another $27. So now, boom, $124 in front with $37 cost, $87 in the black. That's badass. We haven't even talked about genetic improvement. We haven't even mentioned it. Well, we have mentioned it, but anyway, that's cool, isn't it? Super rad, but wait, 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 there's more, there's more, there's more. No time to explain, get in the car. Let me explain, this is rad. Why is this so cool? Why is this so cool? Let me tell you about my normal talk, which is building a better cow. The perfect new beef cow calves as a three-year-old already having weaned one calf. How do we get there? Well, you look after them when they're little, right? Cows on average take about 55 days after the calf to get their shit together. Heifers, on the other hand, take another 20 to 30 days. So they could take up to 85 days. Now they're pregnant for about 280, 279 in the Angus breed. Thanks to breed plan, we brought it forward four days for 283. 280 plus 85 is 365. That number sounds familiar for a reason. So... If you join your heifers the same time as your cows, the heifers that calve on day one of the calving season, the same as the cows, will on average just be starting to cycle when the bull's going the next year. And that's bad. We want, them, we want them all cycling when the bull goes in. So by bringing them forward, the more we can bring them forward, the more likely they are to get back in calf. And here's some really cool stuff, which is coming up here in a minute. How can we fix this? Well, we can, if we had 13 months in a year, if we could slow the rate that the earth goes, goes around the sun, we wouldn't even need a preg test probably. We'd have exceptional conception rates. Can we shorten the gestation? Well, look, we are with that with breed plan already minus four days. How far can we go? We don't know. I've got a bull that I own that's minus 15.2 for GL. Wow, man, before long, I'll be AI and I'll have to get out of the crush in a hurry. Other things you calve on me. Um, could we calve one month later each year? Yes, but then you're going to get out of sync with your feet. But we can with the heifers, right? We can join those heifers early. With AI, we can even bring it even closer. That's, that's the dream. That's just checking how much, how much time I've got. We're going, we're going okay, team. We still got time. Hopefully you're listening fast because I'm talking fast. 
All right, so an early and short heifer joining is an early and short heifer calving, and it, it just gives them extra time to get back in calf, buying more time to get back in calf. Now, here's the awesome stuff. This is Cushman. So in the U.S., they ran this big study up at Miles City, Montana. They had, a, they had a cow herd, and they were trying to work out whether twinning is heritable, and they had all the data from these girls from all the way back in, say, 2001 or whenever it was, um, and they tracked them through their entire life, and they kept track of every calf they produced and whether or not they got pregnant. So in the first year, they categorized them into three groups. Now look at that far to the left. Did you calve in the first 21 days? Did you calve in the second 21 days? Or did you calve in the last 21 days? And you're either a you know, blue ribbon, a red ribbon, or gold, silver, bronze. You dig what I'm saying? And that's what you were for the rest of your life. So if those girls on the left that are 100% as first calvers, or as heifers, they calved in the first 21 days. So the next year, what happened? Well, the next year, when the second conception, <coughs> they had a 93.5% conception rate. But those girls that calved in the second 21 days, they only had an 87.5% conception rate. And the girls that calved in the last 21 days, those poor girls only had about a 82, 83% conception rate. And what I say to my clients is, I don't even want those girls to get be in the, on the farm in the first place. I want to shorten my heifer joining. Those, those gray, that gray bar there, I don't even want them on my farm because they are going to cost me for the rest of their life if they happen to stay in the herd. And a lot of them are gonna be empty the next year. Cause here's the rad thing. Those blue ribbons up there at the front, the girls that calved in the first 21 days, it isn't until about the sixth or seventh year that they start to catch up with the ones that calved in the second to last 21 days. And the only reason those second to 21, last 21 days are catching up is because more of them are disappearing from the system. If you look at the survival curve, you know, it was hundred percent of all of them on the first year, you know, the first 21 days, second 21 days, third 21 days. And then the second year, you know, we've lost 7% of, um, of the girls in the first 21 days. We've lost 13% of the ones in the second 21 days. We've lost 17% of the girls in the last 21 days. And over time, when you go out to nine, nine conception later, only 40% of those girls that calved in the last 21 days are still there versus um, uh, about 60% of the ones that calved in the first 21 days. So the point of it is this pays dividends. And why does it pay dividends? Because calving early also equates to a heavier calf. So if you look at the calves in the, in the first year, they were significantly heavier. And it wasn't until the year six that you could, that there was no longer a statistical difference between the girls that calved in the first 21 days as a heifer from the ones that calved in the last 21 days as a heifer. And the cool thing in this data set, according to Cushman, is the animals that were still there nine years later, the girls that calved in the first 21 days, which is the ones in the last 21 days, in their lifetime, calved in a whole additional calf in weaning weight. Kilograms of beef per hectare, baby, get it done. It's awesome. So early and short joining, great tool. Make sure you're doing it. So I got some slogans for you for it. Join more heifers, let love pick your replacement. Your best heifers are your pregnant heifers. Obviously, you know, like, heck, I don't care what they look like. As long as if their pregnancy is more important, and there's no tragedy in an empty heifer. They can always go to the sale yard. You can grass finish them. They can go into a feedlot for short days, long fed, they'll be away. Three to four week mating. I got lots of guys who do two rounds of AI. I got some guys who just do one round of AI, and that's all they get. Some of those who one round, back them up to 2%, maybe sell the lates. Most importantly, don't get married to your heifers. If you're trying to get all your heifers pregnant, you are already going into this heifer mating program with the wrong idea in mind. You, the ones that fall pregnant are the ones that you want to keep, at least in a commercial setting. I mean, if you got, you know, paratrooper with boobs with an udder, you, you probably might want to make sure she gets pregnant. <laughs> but generally speaking, I want the AI program to pick them out. I mean, like, honestly, like trying to pick out your heifers when they're nine to 10 months old and claiming that you picked the very best of them, unless you got breed plan figures to work with, is a little bit like me when I was on the same age as this fellow, Macaulay Culkin. I thought, I want to be like him when I grow up. And I'm over here in Australia. I've got about a thousand cows and I've got a veterinary clinic and I've got four beautiful children and he's a heroin addict. So I would have missed it. I would have, I would have missed it. I think I'm doing okay. I'm glad to be me and not Macaulay Culkin. But he's, I'm sure he's still a hell of a nice guy. And the other comment is, is look to the dam, you know, like um, when it comes to a heifer, don't look at her to work out whether she's good. Look to her mother. This is what my dad told me when I went to college. He said, "Son, you're going to meet a lot of girls up there in college. Only two girls in my high school class in the town of Wilders, Colorado, which is only 12 people at the time so I went to uni and boy there were a lot of people and a lot of them were girls and um everyone I met <laughs> if I started talking to them and they kind of liked me a little bit I'd, I'd work into the conversation so what does your mother look like that's one hell of a way to absolutely sink negotiations <laughs> I always look to the damn someone said to me do you want to go with Ellen McPherson Ellen McPherson's daughter I'm going to go hell yes because she's got great feet sadly she's just got boys but she's 50 years old at that stage and get good looking bulls too ABS has plenty. Like, look at these two. I mean, they were pretty innocuous. You got a you know, red Angus and a blonde Aquitaine. You wouldn't have expected anything was going to go awry. What about this cute little fella? Low birth weight, good calving ease. Yeah, big mature cow weight, 20,000 day weights blown off the rector. 
top 1% for 20,000 day weight. I think he's even got a small scrotal conference. I'm not sure. We'll find out. But lastly, get back into the PDSs. PDSs are awesome. If, if you don't have a producer group, make one so you can get a PDS going. They are just awesome. Here's the, the work from our guys. The producers went in pretty much, the guys that went into this program didn't want AI. They only came into it because of the PDS and they had a fairly neutral view of the advantages of, the, of integrating fixed time AI. But after the trial, so the reds before and the blues after, do they think it helped? It was nuts. It's pretty cool. It worked out well in field days with extension. <clears throat> and um, yeah, just fantastic. So you got your cows there. Remember, they work for you. They're your employee. And your best employees have early and your genetics. What do you see here? Beautiful heifer. What do I see here? An animal that needs AI. What do you see here? That's my dog. Yeah, just my dog. I don't know what you saw. Love the heat. Get in the kitchen. You doggy. This is in the morning of an AI program. This is the heat rolling off of, and that's what they call it, heat. All right, so now let's talk about players. Um, I've still got lovely Jen. Is these are all things that I've learned over the years on integrating fixed time AI and, and some, of the, the, some of the issues that I ran into. So you're going to have a bat. You want to get some runs on the board, right? So you want, to, you want to optimize your success. If you haven't done it before and you know someone who has, have them come out and help you put in devices, give injections, um, you know, work with your technician and use the program that they want. You know, we've got Bose Sync, J Sync, Coast Sync, Kitchen Sync. Don't worry so much about the program. Let your technician and pick the program they'll use what they're comfortable with go with their experience if you know someone who does a lot of droughties and they said oh look i can do some angus for you you might want to search a bit more information or vice versa but generally speaking go with what people are comfortable with so tips for the new players got a few for you good cow selection is key you know give them a good look um you know that we used to the, what this image is about is um in africa they worked out if you blow into push air and create um positive pressure inside the vagina of the cow stimulates milk let down. Many of us have seen those pictures of the guys blowing and you know, it's kind of humorous, but um, yeah, that's what that's about. Are they cycling is important. So key, they gotta be the right size. Remember that graph I showed you before and they need to be on a rising plane of nutrition. This is at Lake Ballard in Western Australia with my little boys. And we went down there and went walking around checking out these cool statues in this art installation. Make sure they aren't pregnant. This is my wife before we had kids, you know, that absolute train wreck when you rock up to a job and it turns out that they're already pregnant. So if you're AIing heifers, just make sure that they aren't pregnant. Um, if you've got a big program, you invest a lot of time and energy into it, go through and check them. I know um, I've rocked up to programs where we've had 60, 70, 80% of them already pregnant when we arrived there and everyone's just disappointed. And that's something that could be managed proactively. Just make sure they aren't pregnant because you can be surprised. Blam, blam. <laughs> <laughs> communication um whoever your service provider is i guess it's the sort of stuff we send out <clears throat> and just um yeah make sure you got clear communication on timings timing is critical it's not like one of those oh it's in the morning she'll be right mate it, it, with fixed time ai it's very critical we're trying to take all these little eggs and we're trying to we're trying and all, all these different cows and we're trying to kind of corral them into a narrow window to ovulate in a relatively succinct window <clears throat> when you put the devices in keep it clean the device a canal device is actually quicker on the handle that you can scrape the vulva with. Um, when you introduce it, go, go a little bit vertical. The urethra lies on the bottom of the floor of the vagina and it'll catch. Heifers sometimes have a little bit of a hymen, so a little bit of gentle pressure. Um, if you think she might be a free martin, have a feel of her udder. Um, and or we, I'll use like an easy bossy type introducer to check to make sure they're not a free martin. Free martins have very short vaginas and no cervix, and you don't want to force something into a, a, um, a free martin. Um, right products, right doses, right time. I, I give out these flexi tubes, makes it real easy. So you're not, a lot of these hormones, you've only got enough for the job. And if you break a bottle, it's bad. So use these, these, uh, these bottle mounted vaccinator guns, keep them vertical and push, push it through, uh, through a tube with an inch and a half long needle. You want to go neatly into the muscle. Um, here we are pushing up a couple of my girls to do. Um, love scratches. Why do I love scratches? Because they're so easy to put on. They're so easy to use. And when I show up and I see something like this, this is a program I did up on a station. I know in advance that I'm going to have trouble. There's a lot of gray in that picture. And so I can, I can, I can forecast that we're kind of pushing the proverbial uphill. So yeah, scratches are grand. And, and you can um, it make, put them in the right spot. Um, you can cut them in half. I got a mate, um, Harry Lawson, 100% AI. Does a great job, but he cuts them into thirds, 100% AI on those budget. He's like, well, we're AI in 8,000 this year. So obviously he's reducing his, uh, his uh, Estratech sticker bill a little bit. So you can cut them and heat them up, put them in a hot, like I, I take a 
uh, skillet or uh, just boil some water, put it in an old Coke bottle, stick it inside an esky. And when they're warm, they stick a lot better, even if it's rainy. These things are amazing. All right, let's talk about tanks. If you're storing semen, um, I've got, this is my big tank that I store stuff in. I've got uh, locations top and bottom with different straws with a description on each, each, uh, each uh, location. Um, within your tank, um, that you've got single or double stack um, lifters. Um, double stacks are great for storage. Single stacks are amazing for, uh, for um, actually working, um, pulling straws up if you're actually AIing. Uh, lots of ways to keep within a same goblet. You can keep a whole host of different things. You know, you have goblets, markers, and straw color. So, you know, you don't want to put two sets of straws in there that have a white goblet with white straws. So, you know, inadvertently, um, inadvertently when, you, when you go out on a job, take the wrong product. This is my USB tank. It's a little single stack. And I just stick my, my what I do is I put a single sire generally um, around the edges there. Um, my tanks that live here, I check them um, weekly. And we've got a uh, Excel spreadsheet so we can monitor the rate if there's an acceleration in which the, the liquid nitrogen is evaporating. Um, don't hurt yourself before your AI season. <laughs> that was me right before an AI season. I had to get a mate into AI for me. And here's something cool. It's colder than hell down in that liquid nitrogen. But when you get up into the neck of that flask, it starts warming up a lot. And you go, oh, geez, it's still minus 40 in there right in the middle. But that's actually pretty bloody warm for that semen. What kills semen is warming up and then being plunged back into that liquid nitrogen. That's the most dangerous thing for that semen that you're storing is to, is to thaw it and freeze it again. You just don't want that to happen. So you want to really manage that closely. Um, so you see folks that are new to AI and, and when they're pulling a straw, they're doing this and see how there's frost all over the next of those straws. That tells you that the humidity of the outside atmosphere is sticking to those straws. You're lifting it too high. Keep it down in the goblet. Try not to use your fingers because there's oils on your fingers. Use your tweezers. Um, and that's a little bit high there even. I like to reach down into the goblet and pull it up out of there. Um, I only keep it up for three or four seconds and then back down again. If, if I'm having trouble with the straw, like I can't get it out because it's a bit tight in the uh, goblet and I'm having trouble, I'll just put it back and let it cool down again and bring it up. I'm really, really anal about this. This is a one percenter job. One percent plus one percent plus one percent plus one percent plus one percent is five percent. Um, quick to the bath cave. So from when I get it out there, at least the way I was taught, I've got three or four seconds to get it into the hot water bath. So plunge it into my hot water bath. Don't cook your swimmers sitting in the hot tub, snow bingo. Um, I've got the uh, ABS makes these lovely cards. Other manufacturers make them as well that give you a quick estimate. I've also got um, a, um, a device there that measures the temperature to make sure everything's hunky dory. Um, and uh, once they're in the bath, you got about 40 seconds to, you need a minimum of 40 seconds, 45 seconds. And then they can be in there for up to 15 minutes. I, I try to cycle them through all thaw, depending on my thought person who's thawing. If they're new to the game, I'll get them to thaw four or five at a time until they get comfortable. And then I'll get down to three at a time. So I'll thaw three in a row. We see what's coming down the race so we can prognosticate what's coming. We'll write the, the ID of the cow and then the ID of the semen that needs is given to the person thawing the semen. And then when they pull the straw out, they'll dry it, read the straw, look at the writing on the, on the piece of paper, dry it, load it into the gun and then wrap it with that same piece of paper. So when, I, when I'm handed that gun, I'm looking at that piece of paper, which I used to wipe the vulva, and I'm looking at the ID of that cow that's written on it and confirming the straw. Um, don't rub the straw vigorously because it'll explode. Man, there's a good joke there, but I'm not gonna go there. Um, I just kind of, like a taco, just kind of roll it. If you, you can create a bit more heat, you don't wanna do that. Um, cut your straw nice and flat. These little cutters on the left are great. If you're, if you're doing something like ET, it's probably a good idea to in between in between each animal cut 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 on the paper to clean that the scissors. You can't have a little bit of semen left on those scissors. Um, it's a very very unlikely instance that you're going to have the last um, bull's semen go in there, but it can happen. Um, here's some work done on the temperature of the bath and the effect on motility. So the top one there is your 37, you know, 37 degrees, and it's the percentage still motile is far better than if it was too hot or too cold. Um, keeping them warm and clean. Um, a lot of people put them down their shirt. Uh, a mate of mine, he, he likes putting a, a, a rectal sleeve down the shirt as well, just to keep them from getting that, the oils from the body contacting it. They make quivers. They're nice. Um, I, I reckon I might invest in one, but what I traditionally do is I've got a hot box and inside the hot box is a little hot water bottle. And I normally have that at the back, at the front of the box. So that uh, in a, and it's covered in a, in a, in a towel and it just keeps that box warm. And I've got a thermometer in there that makes sure it's not getting excessively warm in there. And it keeps my guns warm when I'm AI when it's cool. But I reckon, invest in a quiver. I reckon they're good. Got to be clean to pass the genes. Give them a bit of a wipe. 101 uses for vet students. This could be of mine. He's a vet student here. He's uh, got fanny spreader on his, uh, on his resume now. And, um, and then just 
measure everything you do and capture that data so that you can continue to adapt, crunch those numbers, work out, you know, I gave GNRH to some of the animals, did what did it improve the outcome, et cetera, et cetera. And then just keep breeding. Here's my oldest. Here's my second oldest, keep on breeding. Finally got myself a heifer, yet we're going good. And uh, lo and behold, even got myself an Angus. Thank you, thank you for your attention. Things I always say to folks, join more heifers. If you want to get pregnant, join them short and early. Preg test as early as you can. Get those girls gone. They're just eating grass for no reason. Calve with feed, don't fight nature, and wean early. These were pretty cool. I think um, Jen uses them as well. And if my son comes home looking like that, I'm definitely gonna wean him early. <laughs> That's us. I've got a YouTube channel, Enoch the Calvet. Please tune in. Love to have you in there. And uh, thank you, uh, Angus Australia. Um, what a great opportunity to spread some of our the research that we had from A Sheep and Meat Livestock Australia and the PDS program. Get into it. Get into it, my friends. Whether it be PDSs or AI in your heifers, it is time. Thank you. <laughs>